When we look at the Sahara today, we imagine an endless ocean of sand, dunes, harsh winds, and parched landscapes that stretch beyond the horizon. It is the very embodiment of a desert, the largest hot desert on Earth, covering 9 million square kilometers across North Africa. Yet what if I told you that this hostile environment, which today seems almost alien to life, was once a lush paradise filled with lakes, rivers, savannas, elephants, hippos, and even thriving human settlements? The Sahara has not always been a desert. Between about 11,000 and 5,000 years ago, during a climatic phase known as the African Human Period AHP, this land was transformed into a fertile green world. This transformation was driven by powerful shifts in Earth's orbit and the monsoon system. The Milankovitch cycles, subtle variations in Earth's tilt and orbit around the sun, triggered stronger African summer monsoons. Rainfall swept into regions where today only dust storms rage. In fact, satellite imagery and paleoclimatic studies show that ancient river systems, such as the Taman Rasset River, once ran to the Sahara, draining into the Atlantic. What is now desert was once a corridor of life. The Sahara's forgotten green past raises some of the most fascinating questions in archaeology and climatology. Who lived here? What cultures thrive? And what traces did they leave behind before the desert swallowed their world? By the end of the video, you will fully understand how the Sahara, today the largest hot desert on Earth, was once a flourishing green paradise filled with rivers, lakes, animals, and thriving human cultures. You will grasp the science of the African human period, the archaeological wonders hidden beneath the sands, and the cultural legacies that shaped civilizations far beyond the desert. And most importantly, you will see how the story of the Green Sahara is not just about the past, but a mirror of our own future, showing how climate can build civilizations, destroy them, and perhaps one day bring the desert back to life again. The Sahara's transformation into a green paradise was not a random accident, but the result of long-term climatic oscillations. Around 12,000 years ago, as the last ice age waned, Earth's axial tilt increased slightly, enhancing the solar radiation over the northern hemisphere. This intensified the West African monsoon system, pushing rainfall thousands of kilometers further north than it reaches today. Eccentricity modulates the amplitude of these precessional beats, and glacial boundary conditions modulate the expression of humid episodes. Modern climate models and proxy syntheses show the AHP and older North African humid periods are paced by precession, but amplitude depends on eccentricity and high latitude conditions. Evidence for this comes not just from climate models, but also from lake sediments, fossil pollen, and isotopic studies of stalagmites. For example, cores taken from the bottom of Lake Yoa in northern Chad reveal layers rich in freshwater diatoms from about 9,000 years ago, a clear indication that permanent water once sustained vast ecosystems. The Sahara bloomed into what scientists call a green Sahara. But this greening was not a one-time event. The Sahara has undergone cycles of aridity and fertility for at least the last 300,000 years. Archaeological evidence shows that humans repeatedly moved in during wet phases and retreated during dry ones. The African humid period, however, was the last great green phase before the desert, as we know it today, returned around 5,000 years ago. And local feedbacks reduced albedo from vegetation, increased evapotranspiration, and enhanced soil moisture, amplified monsoon penetration northwards. Conversely, vegetation loss produces positive feedbacks toward rapid aridification. Modeling studies and proxy work demonstrate these biogeophysical feedbacks were essential to the greening and the abruptness of termination. But when the rain started to come, people followed. The archaeological record of the Green Sahara is extraordinarily rich, though still only partly uncovered. Across regions such as Nabdaplai in southern Egypt, the Tassili Enager in Algeria, and Gabero in Niger, archaeologists have unearthed the remains of societies that thrived in this forgotten paradise. At Nabdaplaya, dating to around 7,000 years ago, researchers discovered ceremonial stone circles that bear striking similarities to later megalithic structures like Stonehenge. Some scholars, including archaeologist Fred Wendorf, argue that these alignments may represent some of the earliest known astronomical monuments in the world, possibly tracking the summer solstice and the movement of stars like Sirius. Meanwhile, in Gabero, excavations led by Paul Sereno revealed an ancient cemetery beneath the dunes of Niger, with burials dating back as far as 10,000 years. The skeletons show a striking cultural continuity. The early Kifian culture, tall hunter-fishers, was succeeded by the Tenerian culture, smaller in stature and more pastoral, who decorated their pottery with elaborate motifs and buried their dead with grave goods and even flowers. Gabero paints a poignant picture of human adaptation to environmental change. Rock art, 
particularly in the Tassili Anager, depicts giraffes, cattle, elephants, and even swimming humans, providing a vivid window into landscapes and daily lives of green Sahara peoples. French ethnographer Henri Lotte, who documented thousands of these paintings in the 1950s, described the round head figures with their haunting, alien-like faces as the most mysterious art ever created by early mankind. So what did people do in this green desert? The archaeological record reveals a spectrum of economic strategies, reflecting the Sahara's transformation over millennia. Early inhabitants were primarily hunter-gatherers, exploiting the abundant wildlife that roamed the savannas. Bones of crocodiles, hippos, and antelope at sites like Gabero show that fishing and hunting were central to survival. As the climate stabilized, around 8,000 years ago, societies began to experiment with pastoralism, the domestication of cattle, sheep, and goats. This shift may have originated from contact with the Nile Valley or even from independent innovation within the Sahara itself. Some scholars argue that the Saharan herders were among the earliest to engage in dairy production, a hypothesis supported by lipid residue analyses of ancient pottery that show traces of milk fats. These pastoralists not only tended animals, but also practiced early forms of social organization and ritual. Nabta Playa, Southwest Egypt preserves early megalithic features, cattle tumuli and botanical and faunal assemblages dated to the early and mid-Holocene. The excavation program of Fred Wendorf and Romwald Schild argue for early pastoralism and ritualized cattle use in the 6th to 7th millennium BCE, though later scholarship has debated whether early cattle that were fully domesticated or managed wild populations. Evidence suggests that herders gathered seasonally at ceremonial sites, combining subsistence with cosmological observation. In many ways, the Sahara was a laboratory for some of the key cultural practices that would later spread into the Nile Valley and beyond. Around 5,500 years ago, however, the Saharan paradise began to unravel. Orbital shifts once again weakened the monsoons. The rains faltered, lakes shrank, and desertification advanced inexorably. By 3000 BCE, most of the Sahara had transformed into the arid desert we know today. This climate collapse had profound consequences. Populations were forced to migrate, seeking water and fertile lands. Many scholars believe that the drying Sahara contributed to the rise of ancient Egyptian civilization. Pastoral groups pushed toward the Nile Valley may have brought with them livestock management, megalithic traditions, and religious practices that would leave a lasting imprint on Egyptian society. As the Egyptologist David Wingro has argued, the roots of Egyptian civilization may lie as much in Sahara as in the Nile. Other groups moved westward into the Sahel and into refugio highlands and oases, influencing early cultures along the Niger River. The desert did not erase these peoples. It displaced them, scattering their knowledge and traditions like seeds on the wind. The Sahara's lost civilizations did not vanish without leaving echoes. Modern genetics has revealed traces of these ancient Saharan peoples in contemporary populations. Studies of mitochondrial DNA and Y-chromosome haplogroups show deep connections between North African, Sub-Saharan, and even European lineages testifying to Sahara's role as a bridge rather than a barrier. Next to linguistic evidence. Two, hints at ancient Saharan roots. Some scholars suggest that proto frosiatic languages may have originated in this green Sahara, spreading outwards into the Nile Valley, the Levant, and the Horn of Africa. The Sahara, in this view, was not merely a stage for human survival, but crucible for cultural innovation. Rock art remains perhaps the most visible legacy. The painted giraffes and swimming figures of Tassili and Ajur continue to fascinate visitors and researchers alike. As UNESCO has recognized, these artworks are not just remnants of vanished societies, but a global heritage, preserving memories of a time when human imagination flourished in a land that no longer exists. Our knowledge of the Green Sahara is still incomplete, but advances in technology are revealing its secrets with breathtaking speed. Science gives us an exact insight into time and development of this regional climatical change. Next to classic archaeology, radiocarbon, optically stimulated luminescence and stratigraphy and isotopes from cemeteries were used. Radar, SIRA radar rivers, SAR and SRTM DMs reveal buried paleo channels and lake basins. Newer multi-satellite methods, L-band SAR, LIDAR were available, multispectral, and machine learning allowed systematic detection of paleo drainages beneath sand cover. LeBlanc's reconstructions of the ancient Megachad project used SRTM slash SAR to map shoreline geomorphology and has reconstructed the contours of the lake that once stretched over 350,000 square kilometers, dwarfing today's Lake Chad. Lacustrine cores, pollen, ostracod, mollusks, and sediment cores helped to reconstruct lake levels and vegetation. 
They're allowing scientists to reconstruct rainfall patterns with ever greater precision. Climate models now show that the Sahara's greening and desertification were not gradual, but often abrupt, occurring over mere decades. This raises unsettling questions about how quickly climates can shift and how societies respond. In 2019, a study led by Jessica Tierney at the University of Arizona confirmed that the Sahara's transition back to desert was not a slow fade, but a rapid collapse within a few centuries for the people living through it. The change must have been catastrophic, a stark reminder of humanity's vulnerability to climate. Why should we care about civilizations that lived in the Sahara thousands of years ago? The answer lies in the mirror they hold up to our own time. The story of the Green Sahara is not just about lost peoples. It is about the intimate connection between climate and civilization. Just as the African humid period created opportunities for human flourishing, its collapse forced migrations, adaptations, and the birth of new societies elsewhere. Today, as we confront global climate change, the Sahara reminds us of the speed and severity of which environmental shifts can reshape human destiny. Troth et al. 2024 warned that the mid-Holocene termination shows early warning flickering before abrupt shifts, precisely the type of nonlinear response that climate change science fears under anthropogenic forcing. The archaeological record also teaches resilience lessons, mobility, diversified subsistence, combined fishing, foraging, herding, and migration were adaptive responses, but cultural losses and demographic pressure had long-term consequences. Moreover, the Green Sahara offers hope. It shows that deserts are not immutable wastelands, but dynamic landscapes capable of transformation. Some scientists even speculate about the long-term future. In about 10,000 years, orbital cycles may again bring rains to the Sahara, reviving it as a grassland. Yet we do not have to wait millennia to witness change. Today, Projects like Africa's Great Green Wall Initiative, a vast effort to restore degraded land with trees and vegetation across the Sahel, are attempting to reverse desertification and bring fertility back to the desert's edge. In this way, humanity is already testing the idea that deserts can be greened, not just by cosmic rhythms, but through deliberate action. The Sahara, it seems, is not eternal but cyclical, a sleeping giant that awakens with the rhythm of the cosmos, and now, perhaps with the touch of human hands. As we gaze upon the Sahara today, it is almost impossible to imagine the herds of giraffes, the fishing villages, the stone circles aligned to the stars. And yet the evidence lies beneath our feet, waiting in ancient lakes, carved into canyon walls, and painted on forgotten rocks. The Sahara was not always a desert. It was once a garden, a cradle of culture, and a stage for human creativity. To explore its lost civilizations is to be reminded that history is not static. Landscape shift climate's pulse, and societies rise and fall with them. The desert silence conceals a story that is both humbling and inspiring. Humbling, because it shows us how fragile our place is in the face of planetary forces. Inspiring, because it reveals the resilience and ingenuity of humans who thrived in a world now vanished. So the next time you see an image of Sahara's endless dunes, remember, this desert was once green. It was a land of rivers and lakes, a home for elephants and hippos, and a canvas for some of humanity's earliest dreams. Its civilizations may be lost, but their echoes still whisper in the sands, calling us to listen, learn, and wonder.